Good afternoon. So uh, my name is Jeff Arnold. I'm uh, an OpenStack architect at Cisco. And Cisco has been involved in OpenStack since the very beginning. I can remember some of the very early design summit sessions back, uh, way back where we were arguing over how to do what turned into quantum and then neutron. And of course, you expect Cisco to be involved in defining the networking technology and creating technologies, creating plugins to support our networking products. What you probably don't know is that Cisco is also a global cloud operator. And uh, this is an increasingly important part of business, Cisco's business. And the guy who has the responsibility of defining that cloud service for our customers and building it out is my colleague Dave Lively. So take it away, Dave. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, as Jeff said, we've been involved in OpenStack for a long time but we've been involved as an operator outside of IT much more recently. And so if I, if I look at sort of you know, where it, it started, it started with the fact that when you look at Cisco's businesses, take all of our big core software-oriented businesses at Cisco, whether it's video, collaboration, security, network management, device management, analytics, et cetera, all of these software businesses are transitioning towards a cloud-based delivery uh, model uh, and all of them are looking for how to build and how to develop their own their own cloud and as you looked at the the applications a few different patterns started to uh, emerge uh, these are sort of common patterns across all of the the different applications one data uh, lots and lots of data and whether that data is coming from things because it's you know data from sensors or you know it's energy data from uh, devices you know, routers, uh, switches, et cetera, or whether that data is things like raw video. So actually, I, I recycled a little bit of this chart from a talk I did at one of the cable tech shows uh, a couple of years ago around uh, cloud DVR. So how do we deliver video from the cloud? And again, data and lots and lots of, of data. And generally, that data tends to want to be closer to the edge, whether it's closer to the source, if it's data coming from sensors, or whether it's closer to the sink, you know, if you're doing uh, on-demand video out to uh, end customers, more efficient to keep that data closer to the, the edge because the other aspect that is common in a lot of these applications is latency and the effect that latency has on the overall customer experience for a lot of these cloud-delivered services and applications. Great example is the Comcast X1 service. That one's running out of cloud, running out of OpenStack. I'm sure you guys uh, either saw it talked about either at this session or I know it was talked about a lot in San Diego and some of the other sessions. Uh, if you've got Comcast X1, every time you press a button on your remote, that's going back up into the cloud. Uh, it's going back up into the cloud to then figure out what you need to render on that, that set-top box screen. And I think it was part of uh, Lou's talk yesterday. We had some of the folks from Cisco's video team talking about you know, what they're doing in cloud-based you know, video. And the model is sort of turning on it, its head, whereas you know, today in most set-top boxes, the majority of the processing work functions, et cetera, are done in the set-top. There's a little bit back in the, the data centers. And that's really flipping on its ears with, with cloud, which is most of the work's being done out of the cloud and even a lot of the data plane, not just the control plane, but now a lot of the data plane is coming from cloud as well. Latency absolutely matters. And you know, latency matters in terms of the quality and the types of the networks that that data is running across. And of course, uh, how close those data centers and how close that data resides. Third key aspect is that a lot of these workloads are very peaky, very bursty. They're not constant state workloads. There's a lot of things that really happen uh, all at once. Again, video, a great example of this. You know, everything happening, especially in video on demand, Friday night, Saturday night is when the vast majorities are, are happening. There's really big peaks in a lot of these applications. Uh, and it's really tough to try to build all the capacity for just one application for your peaks when the majority of it's gonna go sit and idle for the vast majority of the time elsewhere. And so how can we start to, to share that and, and monetize that as well? And then the other aspect is that everything moves really, really quickly once you move into to cloud. And so, you know, again, I'll keep using video as a good example because it's one that I've been in for a, a long time from a, a market perspective. The set-top box experience hasn't really changed that much 
in the last decade. The, the pace at which you have to develop set software for the set-top box uh, and then qualify it, test it, roll it out to all of your set-top boxes because that's running and resident on the set-top boxes is often a 12 to 18 month process at, at best. And so it takes a long time to roll out new services and capabilities. But Netflix on the opposite extreme, they could change their experience literally every other day if they wanted to because the experience is owned and lives and runs up in the, the cloud. Comcast, another great example, is they can modify their X1 user experience. And in fact, just in the time that I've had my X1 box at home, I've gone through two or three different uh, user experience changes, and I've seen a lot of different applications rolled out onto that because they can do it in cloud and because they have to do it in cloud. And so that's the other aspect that's, that's driving this is, you know, not only is uh, our faster pace enabled by cloud, but because the competition for a lot of the existing businesses, whether it's collaboration, security, network and device management, video, all those software businesses at Cisco, the competition is a cloud-delivered model, and it's a cloud-delivered model that moves much more quickly than you know, uh, traditional groups have been able to do writing traditional software that then, they then sell to, to enterprise. And so all of this is moved towards a we need to be developing on top of and for cloud as the, the Cisco application groups. And so, you know, then the choice was, all right, so what cloud do we build? What cloud do we use? Because there's lots of different models that are out there. Uh, and, and a lot of you guys probably know, SaaS isn't cloud, right? Software as a service and cloud, not the, the same thing. And so as each of the different groups was looking at you know, how do I deliver my application in more of a SaaS-like, cloud-like model, uh, they all started down different paths. Some of them were looking at just, you know, dedicated hosting and, and gear uh, that they would run their application on. Others were looking at how do I leverage existing public clouds that are out there. Others were looking at how do we develop our own cloud and run it in our own cloud. OpenStack was uh, often chosen, but there were even multiple different iterations of, of OpenStack that were chosen. But ultimately, when we took a step back from a Cisco perspective and said, we need to take a little bit better control over our own destiny in the software market and in the cloud market, and it is core to our success. It's core to our strategy to, to own and leverage that core cloud component. And so when we looked at the different options that were out there, uh, as a company, the company chose OpenStack as that platform for software development. Uh, and, and sort of a few reasons, but the main one is, again, go back to that previous chart of speed. The main one is speed. We need to be able to develop quickly. We need to be able to have everything be automated, everything be accessible via an API. Another key aspect of Cisco's strategy is a combination of both a public cloud deployment model and a private cloud deployment model. And so our application developers, you know, I'll take collaboration as an example, want to be able to deploy some of their applications and assets up into a, a public facing cloud where their applications and services are available over the internet. Others may need to go on-prem in major enterprises. They don't want to have to develop the two different applications with two different operating models, two different architectures for public cloud versus private cloud. So if we can leverage OpenStack as a, a common open standards-based model that we can use either on-prem or off-prem, then we have a single development environment that we can use for our application. So much better from an application developer standpoint if we can develop to one set of standards and have both public and, and private models. And so, you know, everything automated, everything via APIs, everything developer-centric. Sorry if to the IT guys, but it's not necessarily funneling through IT work order requests and service catalogs, but it's, uh, you know, you don't order compute out of a catalog. You fire off an API which spins up a server and you're using it. There's no order, there's no approval process for that order. And this is actually one of the interesting things that, uh, has changed in how developers and others consume cloud is there's a lot of products that are out there, especially in the sort of the enterprise space, the IT space, that are very service catalog-like. And this whole concept of I'm gonna go to my portal and I'm gonna pick my services out of a service catalog and I'm gonna order those services is very contrary to how developers want to do things. Developers want to be able to just spin up a server, use it, all right, I'm done, let me you know, spin it down, turn it back off. And so it's less of a order something from a, from a catalog and more of a 
use and consume services. And so, you know, for lack of a better term, now what developers are quote unquote ordering from the catalog is they're ordering an empty box. Here's an empty box. You can put whatever is in that box that's, uh, that's available. You can put it together in whatever way that you want available. And we're just going to measure what goes into that box and comes out of that box. And at the end of the month, you're going to get a bill for how much you consumed out of that box. So you're ordering the capability as opposed to ordering the individual services. And so that's greatly increased the agility uh, of a lot of our developers. Uh, and the other reason why we needed to, to build our own cloud uh, is, you know, some people call it drinking their own champagne, but we'll go back to the, uh, the original statement here, which is to eat your own dog food. So Cisco's strategy has been for a long time now developing technology for enterprises, service providers, et cetera, to build clouds. We've been in the OpenStack business for a, a long time. What better way to help drive our own internal products whether they're the switches, servers, software, et cetera, to be ready for a cloud model than by running uh, a massive scale, multi-tenant cloud at scale uh, ourselves. We can be you know, our own best customer, sometimes our own worst customer, uh, depending upon the, the situation. But you know, we're certainly use case number one when it comes to a lot of those new products and, and new services that are being built into to cloud. And so you know, it helps our developers back on the hardware side. You know, at Cisco, sometimes the you know, enterprise market's not the same as the service provider market. Sometimes you know, even the service provider market for a private cloud is different than what a service provider would need to be able to build something at global scale. And so it's very important for us you know, to build this cloud using our own products, help drive our own products to be better in cloud. So it's really kind of a sort of a back and forth relationship uh, inside at Cisco, which is, you know, we're both the operator, but I'm also the operator using Cisco kit. So I'm building all of this cloud on Cisco UCS, on Cisco, you know, Nexus. It's, it's all Cisco kit that sits in the back end. And then it's, you know, generally a bunch of open source software, some commercial software, et cetera, that sits, you know, sort of on top of and, and around it. But, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, a, a global cloud, but, you know, let's rewind two years ago when we first really started this, this cloud, and it was really uh, only a couple of spots. So we had, you know, one region in Texas, one region in, in North Carolina. This was, this was our starting point. This is where we started uh, a, a couple of years ago. So not terribly global in nature to start, but everyone's got to start uh, uh, somewhere. And the services that we started with were, you know, all the, the core services that, you know, everyone here that, you know, sort of goes to all these OpenStack sessions that you all know and love. So, you know, Nova-based compute services, we've got Cinder-based storage services, Swift-based storage services, Keystone for authorization, we've got heat capabilities for orchestration, Solometer now for, you know, alerting capability, obviously a lot of Neutron functionality uh, within our cloud at Cisco, private networks, load balancing, firewall, uh, you know, floating IPs, other capabilities on the, the networking side, but you know, it's the sort of the, the core base building blocks that most developers are you know, looking at and leveraging and, and using today. So you know, we're working on higher level services, we're working on adding things like database capabilities, big data capabilities, you know, more advanced networking functionality, things like that into the cloud. But you know, again, you start with the, the basics and the basics in cloud means you know, starting with core you know, compute storage uh, Etc. But the one thing that you know we certainly found out rather quickly as we started building this this cloud is that you know there's the OpenStack services and capabilities, and that's great for that sort of, you know set of services. You know, it's now I can spin up VMs and things like that. But when you want to offer an actual service based on OpenStack, there's a lot more work and effort that goes into offering a service based on OpenStack than just the OpenStack components themselves. And so, you know, again, I've seen people wearing, you know, shirts is, uh, um, we don't see any here in the audience though, is, uh, well, it worked on DevStack. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of one of those common things, right? Which is, you know, I downloaded DevStack, I got it up and running my service, it worked on DevStack, why is it not working in the, the, the bigger cloud? And there's, there's a lot more to a cloud than just the base OpenStack services. And even the behavior of some of the services are a lot different when you try to run them, you know, at a much larger scale and in a multi-tenant environment than, than, than otherwise. And so whether it's things like monitoring and all the software that has to sit around the cloud to, to monitor the cloud, there's not, 
you know, a core OpenStack project for that yet, although you know, I know there's work there. Cloud Pulse, is that right, Jeff, is one of the new projects? Manaska. So there's a couple of new projects that are, that are up uh, and going in the, the monitoring space. The whole software life cycle of how do I deploy it, how do I maintain code, how do I merge in updates to code, and how do I maintain you know, all of this and be able to do continual upgrades. A lot of work that gets spun around OpenStack for how do I automate the deployment of not just the OpenStack components, but all the rest of the components uh, in the system as well. OpenStack's got authorization uh, capability with Keystone, but you still need some sort of an identity management system that's sitting behind it. And if you're just you know, internal in an enterprise, you can you know, tie it in via you know, LDAP or Active Directory to your AD uh, system. But again, if you're trying to do something that's you know, multi-tenant, federated, et cetera, you need much more that sits next to it uh, and behind it to be able to make all of that work. Metering and billing capabilities, if you're gonna do something in a multi-tenant environment, you need metering and billing capabilities so that you can start to look at not just the services in OpenStack, how many hours was, excuse me, this instance on versus, you know, how many gigabytes per month of storage did I use here, but, you know, also how much network traffic uh, was, was passing back and forth. So you need to be able to meter and bill for services that sit outside of, of OpenStack, uh, and then you need to be able to onboard customers. And so, you know, something needs to sit there that says, create this customer. You know, in OpenStack, you've got the concept of a project that lives within one region. Well, customers think a little bit differently than that as well. I mean, I've got a, a customer and I have an account. In my account, I may spin up projects in multiple regions, but I still need that level of hierarchy. And again, that doesn't exist within, within OpenStack uh, today, or at least it didn't when we started uh, down this road a, a couple of years ago. So lots of stuff is progressing, but at least when we got started, a lot more involved in building and running a cloud service based on OpenStack than just the core OpenStack services the, themselves. And so, you know, if I go back to, you know, where we start with that footprint uh, and where are we going, one of the things we found was that as we started talking to more and more service providers that are out there in the market, uh, you know, whereas cloud was core to what we were doing, some of the service providers we were talking with decided, you know what, I need to offer cloud services, but actually building and operating a, a cloud, especially a global cloud, isn't necessarily core to my business. Uh, and so that's where we started partnering with service providers. And so Telstra was the first service provider that we announced a partnership with. We announced it when we uh, uh, first launched this service and talked about it uh, almost a year ago, about a year ago uh, at this point. Deutsche Telekom uh, was the, the more recent one that we've talked about and, uh, and announced. So they're the only two that we've publicly talked about. There's multiple more that are, I hope you'll be able to talk about here uh, very soon. But the premise here is it's not a typical Cisco premise of I'm going to sell Telstra gear. Uh, maybe I'm going to sell them a full reference architecture. Maybe I'll sell them the, the full set of software that we run and then they run and operate the cloud. The premise here was, again, Telstra was saying to us, Cisco, it's not our strategy to be the builder and operator of uh, an OpenStack-based public cloud service. I need that service and capability as part of my portfolio, as part of my overall cloud strategy to offer my customers, but I don't have the, the skill or expertise to be able to you know, build and run it and compete on a, on a global basis. Cisco, you guys are building a global cloud. Can we partner with you? Uh, and so, you know, as we looked at it, uh, as, as really a strategy started to, to cement itself is as we can partner with service providers around the globe, we can deploy regions of our cloud into their data centers. So we've got regions up and running in Telstra's data centers today. We're installing those regions. We'll have them up and running in uh, Deutsche Telekom's data centers uh, in Germany later this year. Uh, we've got the same hardware, the same architecture, the same services, software, uh, et cetera, now deployed in multiple data centers uh, around the globe. And so if you look at where this footprint goes, you know, now I've got multiple regions uh, up and running in the United States. We've got uh, a couple of regions up and running in Europe, and we're adding more before the end of this year. So we'll have multiple regions running in, in Europe. Uh, again, some of those are with uh, Deutsche Telekom in Germany. 
We've got regions up and running in Australia with Telstra. We'll have more regions coming up later on this year in Asia uh, as well. So now we've got this global presence being built in conjunction with our service providers uh, and being built in conjunction with their facilities, not only on the data center side, but their facilities on the network side as well. So we start being able to leverage uh, a cloud deployment that is in service provider networks closer out to the edge of the infrastructure, closer out to the edges of their network, so closer to their customers, closer to where those data, those sensors, et cetera, lie for you know, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything type applications. So a significant amount more footprint being deployed. Again, this is only with the first couple of partners that we have deployed. Many more partners are coming, and you know, our strategy here is less around yeah, so sort of maybe more like a Google or an Amazon strategy, which is how do I build the smallest number of massive data centers that gives me a reasonable you know, sort of latency reach policy uh, globally? Our strategy is not the opposite uh, of that, but it's certainly more towards the other spectrum, which is especially when you look at data centric capabilities, network centric applications, lots of data coming in from you know, sensors and you know, data and things and stuff like that on, on the edge of the network, that data tends to want to live out closer to the edge of the network. The applications tend to want to be deployed further out in the network, closer to where the end customers, the end data goes. The applications, the virtual network services tend to want to live further out towards the edge of the network, near the edges of the physical infrastructure, so I can spin up virtual firewalls or virtual BRAS or virtual VPNs or virtual other services that sit out in the edge of the network. And so now it's more about how do we build more regions in more countries, because by the way, data sovereignty is also uh, a key part of that, that aspect, by building more regions in more countries attached to the edges of more service provider edge locations, now we start to build this you know, global uh, cloud and even ultimately global federated network of clouds as we start to bring in you know, partner clouds and on-premise private clouds uh, as well that has the same underlying platform really spread out across the entire globe. So from an application developer standpoint, now I can develop my application you know, one time and I have a much larger footprint of where that application is going to, to go, where that application could be deployed. Much better profiles in terms of reaching some of those smaller regions out that if I'm deploying an app into you know, one of the major global public cloud providers, I may have a choice of six or eight, maybe a, a dozen regions that, that can get deployed in. Uh, ultimately, as we deploy more locations with more service providers, we'll have you know, 50, 60 plus locations. Uh, around the globe, where you can start to put this in. And again, think back to one of the reasons why we chose OpenStack uh, as a cloud, is the open aspect of it. Open standards and the ability to now extend that cloud out on premise. Or maybe you're extending that cloud or extending some of the, the core compute and storage capabilities you know, out to devices that live on prem, or maybe they're you know, in you know, really small racks of equipment that sit next to the edge routers in service provider locations. Maybe they're blades that sit inside the routers themselves. If I can leverage an open source cloud platform as a way to gain access to compute and storage, and that compute and storage is tied in together with network, now I can start to do a lot more interesting uh, things. And so, uh, you know, Sun said a long time ago, back in the, the 80s, the, the network is the, the computer. And, and I think it was, I think it's probably more right now than it was then. We've had a lot of stuff sort of come to be. And I think it's been right to varying degrees uh, over time. But if you look at where we are now and the amount of computing power that you have that you can get you know even onto very small things you know that computing power is very distributed very distributed across uh, a network and now even use a lot of, of uh, hype and talk these days about even fog computing right which is you know there isn't so much the cloud but it really starts to extend out closer to the edge into more devices 
more on-prem. You know, this is one of the things that's uh, enabled through open source and, and open standards and being able to drive with, with OpenStack. And so this is one of the reasons why, again, we chose OpenStack as that platform that we want to build on because we have this community that we can leverage that's helping to develop services and this community of partners and other providers that are spinning up OpenStack-based clouds while they're not Cisco's. Again, same core software, same core services, same set of standards. And if we can start looking at how do we unify things around you know, APIs so that we can start to federate between disparate clouds, this is where things really start to become interesting from an OpenStack uh, perspective. And so you know, as we look at, at where we are uh, today, you know, there's some, still some challenges in terms of getting to where we, we need to go. There's challenges on the federation uh, front. You know, Jeff over here, he's got a, a blueprint and a working group that's spun up around how do we look at and start addressing some of these challenges around federation. You've got multi-provider clouds. And, you know, so just take the cloud that we're building uh, is you know, sort of one cloud but sold through multiple providers in multiple providers network with different identity systems, different, different networks that it has to tie in together to. And that's just with the one cloud that we're doing the you know, sort of continuous development and deployment of software to. Now think of all the other service providers or cloud providers that are building OpenStack-based clouds. Think of all the on-premise enterprises that are building OpenStack-based clouds. How do you enable federation such that I can easily put parts of my application in one versus the other, or even across both, put them into different ones, multi-provider, multi-tenant, multi-network. And networking at scale is one of the other big challenges that, that still remains. And this is obviously a key focus for us here at Cisco, not so much uh, in my group, but in some of the other groups at, at Cisco from us solving the, these problems. You know, major issues, especially when you start to look at multi-tenancy and OpenStack, and when you start to look at the layer two and layer three forwarding capabilities all the way down into the hypervisor, you know, how do I offload some of those to the NIC so the NIC can take on some of them? How do I do things like ARP suppression so that I can you know, keep the broadcast traffic more localized instead of spreading? Uh, and so there's some talks I know uh, this week in the developer side around the work that we're doing with uh, ACI, our application-centric uh, infrastructure, uh, and OpenStack and the plugins there. There's other talks that are going on around group-based policy uh, and how we start to think on application-level policy uh, and how that gets implemented not only in the virtual networks but in the physical networks underneath as we look to scale. A lot of focus and effort on IPv6. Again, think back to one of the drivers as to why we're doing this, why we chose OpenStack and why we chose to build our own cloud is around building a platform for the Internet of Everything. Uh, and the Internet of Everything has lots of things that are sitting out there. And every one of those things needs an address. Uh, and you know, every one of those addresses can't be an IPv4 address. So IPv6 is going to become crucial I'll go back to my video example again. Video is just one of the early examples of that. Think of every set-top box that's out there. In every set-top box, there's multiple in every house. As those set-top boxes are really sort of extensions that are connected back into the cloud, again, IPv6 from an addressing perspective becomes key for those, those set-tops. And as we move from set-tops to sensors to you know, wearables and everything else that's going to have some sort of an IP address, you know, again, V6 becomes, becomes critical. Uh, uh, DNS, uh, actually that's a typo, I should have said DHCP, but DHCP is another, uh, another key one, another key challenge uh, that we've hit. And if you had asked me two years ago when we got started uh, in, in building the, the OpenStack cloud, what the major source of frustration I was going to have sort of year one as, as we built this out, I would not have predicted that it would have been issues with, with DHCP. But you know, one thing that we've found uh, in, in OpenStack, and this sort of leads into the, the, the next challenge, is just because it works, uh, just, be, or just because it's in a release of OpenStack doesn't mean it works. Sorry, unfortunately. Just because it works doesn't mean it works in a multi-tenant environment. And just because it works in a multi-tenant environment doesn't mean it works at a multi-tenant environment at scale. Uh, and so, you know, DNS was, or, or, sorry, I keep saying that. I've got DNS on the brain. DHCP was just one of the, the early uh, examples there. There's a whole lot of examples. Uh, another one of my favorite ones to use is, is Solometer. 
So Solometer has been around for a few releases uh, now. I think it came out in Grizzly uh, is really where it first started. But you know, even now in the, the, the latest releases, it's still possible to essentially do what amounts to a denial of service attack against uh, a lot of the tenants by doing your own user-defined metrics within Solometer because there aren't a lot of uh, ways to clamp down on the multi-tenancy uh, capabilities when you start having multiple folks in there. And so, uh, again, the, the last challenge here is, you know, a question I often get, uh, and it, it ends up being a rather frustrating question is, so what release of OpenStack are you running? Uh, and, and my, uh, depending on my mood, flippant answer is, why do you care? You shouldn't care what release of OpenStack I'm running because the reality is, I'm actually running sort of a hodgepodge of multiple releases. I may have some core stuff that's Ice House because it was you know, deployed when we were based on Ice House and has you know, been stable and been rock solid. Other stuff, I may be running the Juno based version. Other stuff, I may be pulling some stuff off of, off of Kilo to be able to backport some fixes from there. But it ends up being you know, sort of this hodgepodge of, of multiple things. And again, just because a feature exists in a given release, doesn't mean it works and doesn't mean we offer it from a cloud perspective. So asking what release, what version of OpenStack you're running is really kind of the wrong question to, to, to be asking. The better question to be asking is what features and capabilities do you support? Uh, and if you do need to ask what release of something, the key thing there is what version of the API are you running? Because that's the thing you're going to talk to. You're going to talk to those APIs. And you need to know the version of those APIs so that you can make sure that you're talking the same uh, version with the same controls. But you don't need to know what release of OpenStack someone's running. You know, Rackspace, they don't advertise. There's, there's nothing written on Rackspace's you know, websites on, you know, we're running Kilo or, or anything else like that. You know, they're, they're based on something underneath, but they have a lot of stuff underneath. Same with Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud. It's based on a particular release, but then there's a lot of work that's been done throughout the, the, the process. Uh, and then the other challenge is when it becomes what release, uh, and I know the OpenStack community is working on this, but what's a release of OpenStack even mean? these days. Uh, and so for me to be running Juno or me to be running, you know, uh, Kilo, yet there's lots of new things that I need to put in, how do we start to decouple the various OpenStack services so that it's less around what release of OpenStack uh, am I running, but now what release of Horizon or what release of Neutron? What release of Neutron with what release of OVS with what release of, you know, these these more individual silos matter significantly more than what release of, of OpenStack. And so, you know, how we deal with that from a reality perspective of sort of software deployment, code deployment, Nova and Neutron tend to still be very coupled uh, with each other from a, a deployment perspective such that changes in one can have a dramatic impact uh, on the other. So how do we more loosely couple these different projects so the different projects can move at their own pace? So it's more the technical side, but then there's the business side and the business sort of questions again around compatibility and what release are you running and what's it mean to be an OpenStack uh, a cloud? Does it mean you need to be having to run the actual code? Does it need to mean you need to run the certain APIs at a certain version? What are the core services? So there's a lot of other aspects that sit into that uh, as well. And the reason this is important is because developers want a hybrid model to be able to deploy their applications on. Hybrid cloud is, is less and less meaning I have VMs on-prem with a layer two tunnel to VMs off-prem. You know, that's sort of what a lot of people used to call hybrid cloud was I've got my enterprise and I'm running you know, some sort of a cloud here or some sort of a virtualization platform here and I'm extending my on-prem enterprise environment up into a, a cloud. Really these days hybrid deployment is more about how I deploy my application across multiple cloud platforms. And it may be across two different public clouds. That's a, a hybrid model. It may be across my on-prem OpenStack and my off-prem uh, public uh, OpenStack cloud uh, as well. But developers want to be able to develop their application uh, such that it can be deployed into different environments with different 
uh, you know, for different control reasons or compliance reasons, security reasons, et cetera, there's a reason why some data needs to live on-prem and some data can live off. You know, if you start thinking about where your data lives versus where your processing lives versus where your presentation front end uh, lives, some of that I may want in a public cloud close to the internet backbone providers with, you know, better DNS and routing and performance, et cetera, but I may want to keep a lot of that data back on-prem. And so hybrid deployments end up taking on sort of a, a different connotation when suddenly I have a common development environment that I can leverage a, a, across all of those. Because, you know, as probably a lot of the folks in this room are, are developers, you all understand, the more permutations you need to test and support, the harder it, it, it becomes. And this is actually another one of those reasons that, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what release of OpenStack a uh, given provider is, is running because you don't need to think about multiple releases anyway. Whatever, whatever they're running and exposing is the latest that they're running and, and exposing. And so even the concept of something like, you know, release notes is, you know, uh, as a cloud provider, you don't need a release notes for Juno and then a release notes for, for Kilo because you're not just deploying Juno and then waiting and deploying Kilo and while well, that region's running Juno and this region's running you know, Kilo and so look at your, look at your release notes. It's, it's more of an ongoing continuous iteration and process of what are the new you know, pieces of functionality, features, capabilities, et cetera, that we just introduced? What are the open issues that you know, sort of exist right now? It's a much different process, a much different mental model than, than, used, to, than used to exist. So you know, back to eating our own dog food. Uh, some of the announced services that are running on the platform uh, today, Cisco Spark, uh, you know, aspects of it are running on top of our cloud today. Our energy management, that was from our acquisition of a company called Julex uh, a little while ago. This is more of an internet of everything type application. We're getting energy uh, data from devices and now you're doing analytics and processing around that. Mobility IQ, this was launched at Mobile World Congress a couple of months ago. This is, uh, again, collecting sensor data from wireless LAN controllers and access points, things like that, and being able to provide you know, more real-time analytics for you know, folks that are looking at doing events. All right, you know, I think that might be, might be Madison Square Garden. It's, a, it's some kind of a stadium. Uh, it's around, all right, where are the, high, why are, are the hot spots right now from a Wi-Fi perspective? You know, where's everyone hanging out? Where are they going? What are they doing? Again, a lot of this becomes around how do I gather a lot of that data? How do we do analysis on that data? And then how do we present that back up uh, in, a, in a way that's, that's sort of uh, useful for others to, to consume? So just a few of the applications that are running on our, our cloud today. But again, think back to those sort of common patterns that were emerging that I talked about uh, at the beginning, whether it's, you know, lots of data, you know, peaks in uh, usage, whether it, whether it is uh, latency profiles for being out close. Again, collaboration, very latency sensitive, tends to be, yeah, kind of peaky. Energy management is less around peaks, more about lots of data. The mobility IQ uh, tends to have lots of big peaks as certain events are running, and I'm getting a lot more data than when events you know, aren't running, but there's also massive amounts of data. So all these applications that are running on top of the Cisco cloud tend to have a lot of those same, in, same common characteristics. And there's people running standard web apps you know, on our cloud as well. You know, standard web applications run just fine. We've got the same compute storage you know, networking capabilities as just about everyone else is, is public cloud out there, but that's not what we're building the cloud for. If all we needed was basic compute and storage, there's you know, lots of ways and reasons uh, uh, that we could get that or other people that we could get that from. The, the core to why we're building and operating a cloud uh, and why we chose OpenStack is on looking at those set of applications and why we partner with service providers, by the way, is looking at those applications that are more network centric, latency sensitive, jitter sensitive, generating significant amounts uh, of data that wants to live out closer to the edge, closer to you know, where those devices, where those, those customers are. Uh, and so uh, you've probably seen this, if you've been to a, a few of the Cisco sessions or you've been to a booth, you, you've sort of seen this, this tagline, uh, you know, build OpenStack, use OpenStack, connect OpenStack. And, and really kind of what we're doing 
in, in CIS is kind of that combination of, of all three. Is we're leveraging a lot of the groups inside of Cisco that are building capabilities around OpenStack. We're doing code contributions and uh, back into the community ourselves as we you know, see issues and, and bu fix bugs, things like that. We're obviously using uh, OpenStack. We're a, a full public operator of OpenStack. You know, I should say you can't go to cloud.cisco.com and enter your information in a credit card and sign up. Uh, that's, you know, we're not a, a retail cloud provider. Doesn't mean we're not a provider of, of public cloud uh, services. If you happen to live in Australia and have an Australian business number, you can go to Telstra's website, uh, sign up with a credit card uh, and get going because they are a, a retail cloud provider to their customers. But you know, Cisco's not uh, at, at this point. So no cloud.cisco.com that you can go to. But we are a major user of, of OpenStack. Uh, and again, for those Cisco applications and services, uh, and then how we connect all of those uh, together. So I think we probably have a couple minutes uh, here at the end. You guys were kind of a quiet group uh, through and didn't ask any questions. But we've probably got a couple more minutes here at the end if anyone has any questions. I was either really thorough or. I was going to ask you one version of OpenStack. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, interesting talk. I'll throw you a question. Um, you talked a lot about doing the federated intercloud thing for presumably managing uh, the federation of cloud infrastructure, being able to manage where things are, pushing things to the edge. Do you see in your customer base the need to federate? services and resources at the application level? Do you see that from your users? And the second part of the question is, for all of the machinery that you've built so far for managing what you do have, do you think that's also applicable to managing user level federations? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. When you look at sort of federating services and, and applications, uh, that's a lot of where we're, we're going, is in how do we make Services are above the infrastructure layer, so not just compute and storage, but services that sit above. Maybe it's you know, messaging or database, or maybe it's specialized you know, an analytics, and being able to make those federated for, for applications and for users that want to keep some of their data in a particular geography and have some of it sit you know, resident uh, elsewhere. So certainly, federation up at an application level uh, is another key part of, of what we're doing. That's less on what we're doing in my group and more what you know, some of the, the groups that sit above us that are developing applications uh, are looking at. In terms of the same infrastructure for user federation, was that the second part of your question? Yeah, I mean, in, in what I've looked at, you, know, you can try to generalize the infrastructure federation, and it, it generalizes to actually being able to manage you know, everything, assuming that you have the right you know, metadata and service catalogs and you know, all that kind of stuff, an agreement across all the different organizations that yeah. you're federating ac ac across. Well, fed and federation's tough, right? Uh, especially at a, at a service provider uh, uh, level, which is why what we're, what we're not doing initially is, you know, deploying some stuff for Telstra and some stuff for DT and some stuff for service provider A, B, and C. Uh, and then if you want to deploy across those service providers, you have to go sign up with Telstra and sign up with DT and sign up with, because that's, that's a federation model. That's like a mobile, um, it's not even more of a mobile roaming model, but it is kind of a federation model where you have different business propositions with different providers. You know, what we're doing is, is more one of whoever you sign up with, let's say you're a customer of Telstra, then you'll have access to all the regions that, are, that have been globally uh, deployed. You don't have to go do separate contracts with each one of those because that's one of those business problems that, that makes it tough. Uh, federation and service providers is kind of tough. Service providers don't really peer with each other terribly well on a whole lot other than sort of, you know, transit IP packets and sort of mobile minutes today. Uh, you know, it, they, you know, didn't get there when people were trying CDN federation, which was a, a big thing of not too many uh, uh, years ago. It's been a lot of things that, that, that hasn't sort of gotten there yet. So, you know, our, our model is sort of sticking a, a, a little bit closer and maintaining a, a little bit more in the middle here to to help this concept than a, a purely everything to everything federated model. I think we'll get there, but to be honest, I think the business challenges in federation are greater than the technical challenges. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. But come see me. But come see Jeff, because he's, he's working on exactly those issues. All right, I'll be hanging out around here if you guys have any other follow-up questions. Thanks very much. <laughs>